So today I'll be talking about AI and ML democratization. Um, so as Adam mentioned, my name is Anthony Bulk. I am a technology director for NTT Data Services. I oversee data, AI, and IoT initiatives across Canada. I'm based in Victoria, BC. And I'm a former Microsoft Data Platform MVP. I run a Power BI user group. So I feel for you, Adam, I know how, how hard and difficult it can be to put these community groups together. Uh, so hats off to you for doing this. Um, I regularly blog and present, presented at Build, Power BI World Tour, Azure Data Bootcamp, a uh, bunch of other events. And ironically, I started my career doing um, Oracle uh, development in you know, Oracle procedures, forms, and reports. Um, I've been doing, you know, working in IT for 15 years, I've always been interested and focused on data. So I would say it's, you know, in Canada, most organizations are in the early stages of adopting AI and ML. They're, you know, they're in the lab, they're starting to experiment with that. Um, there are exceptions, but generally speaking, um, it's still early days. And it is a journey, you know, for organizations to get from that lab stage to the hub. And organizations, they move through this, you know, through these different stages at different speeds. And that, the speed at which they can move is largely dependent on the culture of the organization. Um, I don't know if you've ever, ever heard the saying, but culture eats strategy for breakfast. So, you know, you might have the best laid out plans, but if your organizational culture is not there, it's very difficult to move quickly. And generally speaking, organizations that, you know, view data as an asset, um, innovation as an enabler, and have a broad general understanding of AI and ML, they can move through these stages fairly quickly. Um, so, you know, as I mentioned, organizations, you know, they start off typically in the lab, looking for quick wins with a minimum investment in technology, right? So they're really trying to, you know, prove that these uh, capabilities and technology is valid and will have a positive uh, business impact to their organization. As they start to develop these models, they'll need to integrate them and move them out of the lab and into the office, right? So they're starting to operationalize these models, integrate them into various systems, whether it's the finance system, the HR system, they're starting to essentially see some real business benefits and they can really kind of boast AI across all areas of the business. And they're starting to have a more formalized structured team and try, starting to develop standards um, and have a preferred technology stack. And eventually as organizations evolve, um, I think we heard about this in our first presentation with BMO, they're really having kind of like a hub and spoke type of model where they have a center of excellence that drives a lot of the strategic initiatives for the whole organization, but AI and ML is very pervasive throughout the organization. So it's not just contained and bottlenecked within a select few, it's kind of in every department, every area, and they're really starting to see the uh, transformative benefits that AI and ML can bring. But of course, you know, you need to make sure that you have an organizational strategy that nurtures the growth of AI and ML capabilities. And that's kind of where democratization can act as a catalyst to help grease the wheels and move the organization forward with AI and ML. So it's really about, you know, empowering people, right? So the more kind of organizational buy-in you get, the broader the support, the better for kind of um, adopting AI and reaching that transformational AI state. Because as I mentioned, right, culture eats strategy for breakfast. So democratizing AI leads to a culture shift because you start to demystify it. It becomes less scary, less unknown, um, business users and the whole organization tend to understand the process. So it becomes easier to move forward with that agenda. But of course, the only way you can really get there is to have a good understanding of your data estate, right? So you need to understand if there's any data uh, hygiene issues, what, how to get to data, 
if you have data of sufficient quantity or if you need to set up new systems to collect additional data or new data feeds. Um, it's also important to have you know, user-friendly tools, right? That provide guidance, not, on, not only on how to use the tool, but also on the process, right? So that more people become familiar with the data science process, the terminology, the limitations. So it becomes easier for different uh, individuals within the organization to articulate their requirements and to know, you know what, where AI can fit and how it can benefit and be used. And of course, you know, as organizations start to mature, they need to support both kind of the development and the implementation of AI ML solutions. So that's where MLOps starts to come into play, where you can start to have that you know, balance between building and operationalizing and using ML to kind of enhance your business. So, you know, I talked a little bit about kind of supporting the need for the two different workflows, right? So what you do when you're building an ML solution is very different than what you do when you deploy it, right? So when you're building it, you're creating data pipelines that might be specific for training, you're, you know, possibly generating or augmenting your data sets, you're training your models, you're validating the models, right? And eventually you get to a point where you want to deploy it and then you will ideally register that model, right? You have mechanisms in place so that it becomes easy to push that model out into various systems where it needs to live. And you have a way to monitor that model to detect you know, drift, whether it's from data or from model accuracy. Um, and central to all of this is essentially model governance, right? So you can understand who is responsible for what aspects. And that model of governance should also cover things around ethics too, because you know that's becoming more and more of an issue that people need to um, be aware of, right? So understanding uh, what data was being used to train the model, understanding um, why the model is making those predictions. So leveraging you know, frameworks like Lime or Shapely to try to make that model a bit more explainable in business terms um, is really key. And as you start to you know, get out of the lab, you want to move towards this continuous development, continuous integration paradigm. In the beginning, you might be doing kind of discrete projects, right? So you have a proof of concept, you build something, you get it into production, you move on to the next one. But eventually you want to start to have a more streamlined, you know, CICD type of process that makes it easy to really push out models, monitor them, and really take on the ma maximize the value that you might get out of ML and AI. So I think most people understand the workflow with uh, machine learning. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about these different steps. The only one I want to pe draw people's attention to is the step two, defining goals, right? Very early on, you want to establish like your target level of accuracy and your minimum level of accuracy. So you might say, oh, you know, I need a system that is at least 90% accurate before I can put it into operation or before I can put it into production. But to start, I need to, it needs to be at least better than a, a coin toss, right? So maybe my first sprint, the goal is to have a model that's 51% accurate. It's a little bit better than a coin toss, right? And then with every subsequent sprint, you'll try to do additional future engineering, maybe collect additional data points, maybe try different algorithms. But the goal of every sprint is to try to increase the accuracy of that model or that system up to the point where it's either you know, reached its end state target goal of 90%, or if you work in this manner, it also gives you the ability of, you know, let's say that you get to 85% accuracy and to get it to 90 is gonna take, you know, took seven, seven sprints to get it to 85% accuracy it's going to take seven more to get it from 85 to 90 because generally speaking, it becomes exponentially harder to squeeze more accuracy out of it. It gives the business and the organization the ability to say, you know what, the goal was 90%, but 85 is good enough for now. We're not going to fully automate this process. It's going to still be semi-supervised by a person. Let's get it into production. 
start to collect some feedback, and we'll work on getting it to 90% accuracy later. And that also ties back into you know, moving to, away from discrete project deployments to um, CI, um, CDCI type of scenario where you can more easily you know, push out new versions and you know, slowly move the accuracy of the model up um, as warranted by business requirements right? and by establishing a proper feedback loop. So, you know, I think we all know um, that most of the effort with building machine learning solution is working with the data, right? Getting the data, cleaning it, understanding it, transforming it. Um, there are lots of like tools and frameworks and existing uh, you know, code libraries to essentially implement the, the last parts of it, which is you know, picking an algorithm, adding some parameters and deploying it. And again, there's tools, right? So like, you know, Microsoft has tools like Azure Machine Learning. You can even now integrate uh, Python and R and SQL Server, MLflow, open source library for model management, data robot platform, model ML, data IQ, right? It go, the list goes on and on. Everybody's investing in kind of enabling uh, tools and data science and machine learning development cycles. Um, also in some surprising and interesting ways too, you're starting to see kind of ML, AI capabilities bubble up in areas where you might not have expected. And then of course, you know, establishing a data ops and ML framework. Um, eventually all aspects, and it's a bit, a bit of an eye test with that diagram, but the point is that you, know, you will need to kind of cover you know, software development, data, and model management, and that you'll start to chip away at this framework uh, bit by bit over time as kind of the solution and the maturity and the capabilities of you know, building AI and ML solutions mature within the organization. And a lot of this is driven by the fact that, um, you know, before it was very difficult to get from, you know, descriptive diagnostic analytics into kind of advanced analytics, predictive and prescriptive. It was hard to get data, hard to find people with the right skills. There wasn't a lot of tools out there that enabled this. But now because of a supply and demand um, issue, the market is really addressing that by you know, introducing tools that make it easy for kind of citizen data scientists to start to explore and implement predictive and prescriptive analytics, as well as you know, there's a plethora of like you know APIs and frameworks and libraries, reusable code segments, right? That people can leverage. And also on top of that, you know, uh, machine learning and data science is you know becoming a hot um, a hot uh, skill in the market, right? So you're starting to see a lot more like uh, graduates coming into the market who are very familiar with how to do these things. So it's less of a barrier. I, I would say that the excuse for not doing this is diminishing. And one thing to be mindful of with an effective data science program, again, you need to have a platform that can cater and enable data prep, because that's a big part of it. Um, auto ML, again, I'll talk a little bit about more about that in the next slide, but you know, any kind of um, you know, program or platform should embrace auto ML. Also ML ops, so both spectrum, the development and the production and operationalization of those models need to be um, enabled and collaboration, right? Because you're gonna have your business folks talking with your data scientists, talking with your IT folks. Everybody needs to be able to collaborate and work together, ideally in a single platform and share notes, right? Think like Jupyter Lab, Jupyter Notebooks, right? Um, and underpinning all of this, of course, is data literacy. You wanna be able to make sure that the whole organization slowly becomes more data literate and can understand you know, how the coefficient of determination might affect the you know, ability to predict the number of appeals, for example, um, and where data quality might bubble up and how you might address data quality issues. And then data governance, right? So being able to understand you know, what data was used to train what models, where did the data come from? Is it internal or external? Can we trust that data? Um, does that data have any potential bias baked into it? Um, so all of these components are kind of critical for really getting an effective data science program within any kind of organization. And so AutoML is really the ability to automate the process of picking one or more algorithms, cycling through a range of hyperparameters, 
training a model, evaluating the results, and then being able to pick the best you know, algorithm or combination of algorithms that you know, are the right fit for that purpose. So if you can automate this process, that means you can produce and run through more experiments. And that also means that you're more likely to get to an end state where you can operationalize some models, start to see some value, and then eventually you know, move the organization forward towards that hub and spoke transformative you know, AI ML maturity level. So as I mentioned, right, there's, these are a few tools, there's many out there. Um, Data IQ is a great end-to-end -end platform. You can deploy it on-prem or in the cloud. It's very flexible. It allows you to you know, drop in your co own code recipes anywhere, includes auto ML, auto ML capabilities, and it caters to both the development and the um, operation and the monitoring of those models. Um, Amazon has one, SageMaker, it's you know, uh, Amazon cloud service if you're an Amazon shop. It's also a great um, solution to kind of democratize and enable more broad uh, AI and ML development. Microsoft has one, the Machine Learning Studio, Google has one, and Power BI also. And this is a, a little bit of a you know, change happening that I'm noticing across all of the market where tools that are more focused on reporting are also starting to introduce kind of ML capabilities so that business users or users focused on building reports can do strategic prototyping and inform, essentially kind of um, do some of the legwork prior to tossing it over the fence to the data science team and say, hey, this is my goal. Here's what I found so far. Can you take this to the next level? So let's talk a little bit about data IQ. So it's um, kind of a drag drop in configure where you can see your data pipeline um, from end to end. So you can easily visually understand how the data is going from these various sources and flowing through your data pipeline and being used to train an algorithm. But the nice thing is that you can also drop in you know, code recipes. So you're not limited to only using the tools that come in the toolbox with this platform. Um, you can create your own custom solution because again, you know, this space and this industry is moving very fast. There's always you know, uh, new white papers coming up on archive. I don't know people use the uh, Andrew Carpathy Sanity Pre Preserver for navigating archive, but it's like, you know, hard to keep up with all the changes. So being, having a platform that's open and that allows you to, you know, inject and use your own code is great to enable innovative solutions. But it's also good for organizations that are still in the lab and they might have code that they've created and are running on a laptop, but they really want to get it off the laptop onto a server and onto a more robust platform. You can drag, you can essentially copy and paste that code into the code recipes that are available with Data IQ. And again, it's a great way, so it's a great platform for data scientists, but it's also great for um, you know, power users or citizen data scientists who want to use this platform to help the you know, data science team or the IT team um, validate some of their thought processes. And, to help articulate their requirements. So you can you know, quickly build a model. Um, you can then use automated machine learning to allow it to pick the right algorithm, develop a strategic prototype that you can then share with others and say, hey, you know, I wanna, in this example, it was trying to determine if they could predict whether or not someone would be approved for a credit card, like kind of a, a risk model. Right? build a quick prototype on data that they know about that they have, then bring it to someone else and say, hey, I, you know, I think I have a model here that can more accurately predict if someone's at risk for um, fraud of credit card, let's take this to the next level. And then that data science team or the IT team can look at what they built and essentially use that as like a starting point for something that's more robust or as like a blueprint or a way to talk further about the requirements or the data needed to build out the solution. And so like Data IQ again, lets end users who may not know anything about which algorithms to use, right? They need a guide. So AutoML baked into Data IQ and, and all, the, all the popular platforms have this capability, let you select 
you know, all the algorithms that fall within this domain. So in this case, it's classification and basically turn on and pick the algorithms that they want to try, specify a range of hyperparameters that so it will automatically cycle through these different hyperparameters and see, you know, what produce the best results so that they can then go back and say, you know what, I grabbed this data, I tried these, you know, three different algorithms with these hyperparameters and it looks like my XGA boost is gonna give the best results, right? Um, but let's like talk, talk with some other experts to see if they agree, or maybe I need to do like an ensemble and set up some kind of voting system or, you know, whatever, whatever the kind of final result be, you have a solid under common understanding uh, starting point that people can all easily talk about and rationalize. So that's data IQ. Um, the other area where it's starting to bubble up AI and ML, and you're starting to see kind of democratization of AI and ML, is in tools like you know Power BI. Tableau has it. Um, I believe ClickSense has it. But essentially, the ability for people building reports, so more of a, like an analyst type of person, right, to enrich their data, enrich their reports with um, predictive and prescriptive analytics. So in Power BI, you know, you get this little brain icon, lets you um, select, you know, for this, in this case, it's a diabetes data set. And they can go and say, okay, well, I want to train my algorithm based on uh, progression. So in this case, I was, you know, trying to predict how quickly diabetes would progress based on some historical data. And it's very much a guided um, user experience, right? So Data IQ is a little bit more technical, right? So it's a platform kind of geared towards developers and data scientists. Um, could be picked up by kind of more casual business users, but there would be a little bit more of a learning curve. Whereas Power BI is very much a guided experience. So you need very little, um, the, basically the, the learning curve is less steep for kind of using and getting into AI and ML when going down a tool for reporting in like Power BI. And so once you picked your historical field for training, it automatically does like a data profile on that column and determines, hey, you know, this is either gonna be, because it's a whole range of values, it's either gonna be a regression type of, um, you know, solution that you need, or it's gonna be a classification. Um, and so again, you can, you know, learn more about these types of uh, like, uh, categories of machine learning with kind of built-in um, links to additional documentation. And you can do some, you know, feature engineering and let you pick which fields you want to use to train your regression algorithm with. Plus, you can then modify those, you know, uh, algorithms really easily in a user-friendly manner. And again, it will automatically go and split the data run through a whole bunch of different regression algorithms and essentially tell you, hey, you know, this algorithm worked the best or this combination of algorithms worked the best. And it might not be the end result that you ultimately put in production, but it's a great starting point. It's a point where, you know, now a person who typically just builds reports and analyzes data can go to the data science team and say, hey, look what I've built, look at the results I have. This is showing promise. Let's continue to invest or Let's put the brakes on this because it's not going to work, right? And again, you know, it's all kind of automated. Tells you and gives you a report on um, the results. So just to end on some final words, right? So you really need to establish a strategy that respects the different workloads, right? So when you're building a model, that's quite a bit different than when you put it in production. You need to monitor it. Um, leverage technology to rapidly build experiments, right? Don't think of these tools as something that's going to um, reduce your ability to execute. Um, think of it as a way to enable business users and average users to more easily explain what they want to do and for them to essentially um, articulate what they want to accomplish. It's essentially an easier starting point, but it also you know, makes it easier to mo manage these models because you know, as you become more effective in the lab, you will, if you don't think about a way to manage the model, you will have a model management problem, right? So having a platform that also addresses that is key and also something that improves data literacy. And again, you know, we talked about this with, um, you know, being able to balance risk and understand the risk, you know, not, 
not all kind of models and not all solutions um, need the same rigor, right? So if you're, and sometimes you need to have solutions that respect kind of business agility, right? Because having a solution that is maybe like highly accurate, but takes too long to get there, it might be too late. The business might have changed by then, right? And so a great example, of course, is, you know, if you're trying to predict how many people are going to be in the store tomorrow, it maybe needs to be accurate plus or minus five people, right? But if you're building a solution to drive a car, it's got to be pretty accurate because you don't want that car to drive over people and kill somebody, right? So it's that balancing act between uh, an understanding the risk reward right, associated with various use cases. So that's it for my talk today. Um, I tweet, I'm on LinkedIn, I blog, and um, I run a Power BI user group. So if you'd like to join, feel free.